diagnosis is a time where your whole reality changes and you've suddenly gone from being someone that you thought was well to someone that's been told they're really unwell. And so trying to cope with that is very difficult. And, and it is a time where you feel very alone. Even if you're surrounded by support, no one else is actually going through that moment. And it's like you have to go and live in a foreign country for a period of time without learning the language. So the doctors speak in confusing terms and they talk very quickly about things. You have to make decisions very quickly. And all of that is it's stuff that you've never thought about before. So I often talk to patients about the fact that it's a little bit like, you know, we give you this information and it's like we're standing you on the edge of the beach and we, we show you where we need you to go and it's to an island that's over in the distance. And you can just see the island but when you ask how, how am I going to get there, we say, well, here's a little coracle, there's a little semicircular boat that you have to stand up in and row. And if you just get yourself over to there, we'll be there ready to do your surgery, you know. And then we disappear. And you're left for three or four days trying to work out how to work this boat and how to get there. You know, it's a really difficult time. It's an unfamiliar circumstance. So it's very, very normal for people to feel very anxious about it and very alone. This uh, video is an attempt to give you a clinician's and patient's perspective of the journey that you're about to embark on. Um, it is a formidable task to get through, but there is hope at the end of this process after you've gone through treatment and patients do return to a normal and functional and rewarding life after their treatment regime. When I, when I was first diagnosed, it's sort of the first instance when they told me I had the tumour. So that, um, you know, that it had to be removed and was quite large and um, the first operation was that procedure. Um, I don't know, I was a bit numb. I was sort of just sort of thought it would be some big lumpy benign thing and it'll go and that'll be it. You know, that's what I thought I was in for. I was a bit numb, that's probably all I could say. I just sort of hit you and you sort of said, oh, okay, this is what we've got to do. And so we took that step and removed the tumour first. And then the next progression was to have my eye removed because the tumour was, uh, it was a cancer that was quite dangerous and we had to get it out. So, But how I felt, um, I was a bit numb, I suppose, first off. That's all I could say about that. I just took the information and let them do what they had to do, yeah. Well, when I was first found out, oh, well, I thought there was something wrong, a couple of my mates took me to the GP. And from there, they got in touch with the Mater Hospital. Oh, well, he did, uh, the doctor did, and he, they sent me down to there, and then I met, I think there was about eight other doctors down there. Then they called me back on a Friday afternoon and said, you know, um, we're going to operate on you on the Monday, which was the 27th of October. And um, I thought, gee, that's quick. <laughs> Bray was diagnosed with um, oral cancer, um, a cancer on her tongue, in middle of March this year. And um, she was operating on 8th of April. Ronald would go to the skin specialist every couple of months and every couple of months there'd be biopsies and pieces taken from either his nose or his face or wherever. And you know that one day that you're going to come back and he's going to say, it's not good. And when he actually did that, it was like you just felt your whole stomach go, mm, here we go. So from then it was sort of, it will be right, we'll be right, we'll get through this, we'll get through this, it's okay. What, um, what are they going to do? They're going to take my whole nose. Your whole nose. Yeah. That was sort of the beginning of it, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because you, you had, at first up, you had different different things going, like uh, saying that... Um, reconstruction. Reconstruction was a possibility. You know, All those possibilities were eventually removed. And, and then you're thinking, okay, this is pretty good. Like, yeah, you're getting a bit, um, like, thinking, well, they're not going to take the whole lot. It's going to be, you know, it's going to be good. It's not going to be as bad as that. But then it's still in the back of your mind mm. that they're going to take it. When I was diagnosed, I, um, I think it's a natural reaction to think, 
you know, how did that happen to me? Um, certainly when I asked that question to Hollenbeck, he explained that there was nothing that I had done or um, had consumed or, you know, being a smoker or anything would have affected that cancer. It was a one in 10 million thing that could arise. And he reassured me that, hey, this is nothing that you've done to cause this to, you know, for you or nothing that I'd been exposed to had caused this cancer. So it was reassuring from your own own point of view to know that there wouldn't have been anything that you could have done to avoid this cancer. It was just written into your history <laughs> as a person and that's what you got. So it was a very rare cancer. So um, he was quite reassuring about that. So I, I, I let myself off the hook that I hadn't caused this cancer for myself. So, you know, that's how I reacted to that, yeah. Can mm. make a bit angry that I don't feel like I do too much wrong to get this, but you know, we can't really dwell on that. We have to concentrate everything we have on fighting it. I guess I, I feel it's not fair. Um, you know, obviously not a heavy smoker or drinker in any, in any way, any case, but I guess it happened, it happens. Um, so I spoke to, I remember I have a conversation with her mum that um, is here, it happening, there's a fix for it. And that we just have to roll with the punches. He put his hand up that had been done three months previous. And he said, you've got a cancer in your throat, which I was told you want to go to Sydney or John Hunter. He go on a day, so I'd had one day. No, no, he said. So I really didn't have any time to uh, start to worry about things. I'm not a worrier anyway, but what happens, happens. But on the way down to the John Hunter, I started to uh, start to worry, worry about my lady and, and my, daughter, my daughter. I don't, I must be a bit strange because I don't worry about myself too much. I just figure what's going to happen happens and that's it. And so I've got a long story short and one day at the art specialist, same and day down John Hunter. When we were told that Eddie had a tumour on his larynx, I was totally devastated because I did not think he would survive it. Because when you hear cancer, the word cancer, it's, to me it was a death thing, that was it. And I was devastated. I was diagnosed with a lump on the roof of my mouth. It was picked up as a, as a would-be abscess. And then on reflection and having to go into hospital, it was found to be a cancerous lump. There was approximately been over two weeks between when I was actually diagnosed and when I had my operation. So there was very little time to even think about anything on what was going on in the whole scheme of things. I didn't understand the enormity of it. There wasn't any, there was nothing that I was given to indicate how much difference this operation was gonna impact on my life. You, you said it made it, everything felt really surreal. It was like a, an unreal feeling, like you weren't really there in the present because of the um, concern about everything, wasn't it? Yeah, it was just, it was, this is happening whether you want it to happen or not. It was like you had no control over what was going on. It was a matter of accepting it and see where it went. When I was first diagnosed uh, with the carcinoma, I was, uh, oh, I was extremely frightened, and, uh, but I knew I also had to tell my daughter. And uh, my daughter came with me to the appointment and um, uh, she asked a lot of the, the questions because I think I was pretty stunned at the time and she wasn't backwards in coming forwards and, and um, asking the hard questions as well.
But at that early stage, it was hard to work out what questions to ask because we were still in no man's land, not really understanding what the impact was going to be. It's like, this is going to happen, but we can't really tell you how it's going to affect you. And you can't really ask us questions because we can't answer them because everybody's individual. Diagnosis is a very difficult time. It's a time where suddenly you're given information that you've not had before. You're asked to digest a lot of, of strange words. The doctors use big terms. They ask you to make medical decisions really quickly. You don't even understand what half of the language is about. So it's really normal to feel confused and, and alone at that time, you know, and it's the beginning of a grief process because no matter what happens from this point, you've been told you have cancer and so your life has changed. You know, so trying to come to terms with that is a huge thing. So it's very, very normal for people to struggle with that and to feel very isolated and alone. It's good to take someone with you to the appointments if you can. If you haven't got someone you can take, you can sometimes ask the nurse to sit in with you. Try and take notes. We give you a lot of information and most people are so stressed they take it home and don't look at it. Um, the Cancer Council particularly have information books. They have question prompt lists in the back of them, which are really good to look at and take to your next appointment with your doctor. They help guide you to know what questions to ask. Having family members with you when, you take, when you're listening to that sort of information is vital because you don't really hear a lot of it. Rani, <laughs> Rani was the one who said, no, Mum, this is what they said and, and this is how it was going to be done. And, you're there taking the information that's relevant to what's going to happen to you, but other family members are also listening a lot more closely, probably. I was a little bit numb about it still. The most important thing is, I think, have the ability to ask the doctors questions. Be whatever they are, and there's no such thing as a silly question if you don't know the answer. It's important to ask questions. If you don't understand what's being said by the doctor, even if you don't stop the doctor and ask them, ask the, one of the nurses or the care coordinators. Often one of the jobs we do as psychologists is to see people to work through some of those issues and work out what they want to do. You know, it's a, it's a big question and often it's a question you have to decide on quickly. What am I going to do? When am I going to have my surgery? What do I have to do? So try and reduce that confusion. Ask questions. People are more than happy to answer your questions and there's no stupid questions. When we're at the, the meeting, uh, the multidisciplinary meeting, they were in one room and doctors would come in um, each time and they would kind of discuss with us what the options were and, and why they were there and then they would go out and I think that they would discuss with other doctors. Um, so that was for quite a, a few doctors came in and just spoke to us. Um, afterwards, we waited in the room while they all met together and kind of gathered their information and kind of assessed what they think would be best. So we were in the loop basically the whole day. We were kind of speaking to doctors continuously, but then once they all had gathered their information, they would go and they spoke together about it. So. And there was a definite plan that was given. Mm, about what would happen. Yeah, the doctors fully explained what my options were. Um, there really was only one option, um, you know, pretty radical surgery and then, like I said, the radiation. So, yeah, everything was really clear. They made it very clear to me, the risks as well as what, you know, the outcomes might have been. So, yeah, it was very clear. They were fantastic. Mm. Mm. The options were, like, you have your nose removed and then have radiation or not have your nose removed and continue on that, that path. Well, I wasn't ready for that path, so the, the options were, were there and everything. So that's the ones I went with. And I think the one that I took was the better option. <laughs> A lot of living to do with me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One of the things that they said, we may have to take out 
some part of the jaw. We may have to remove teeth. After the surgery, you may have to have radiotherapy. You may have to have chemo. It, everything is sort of up in the air to start with because until you actually go through the operation and they know what they're dealing with because they can't really get at it when it's inside your mouth till they open you up. You're, one of the things I suppose was a bit confronting was on the piece of paper that I had to sign for the first lot of surgery was the side effects of this surgery. And one of the things they had on it was death. So there is an option where you might not survive the surgery. That was the worst case scenario. They gave us always the worst case scenario. Some of the things that could go wrong were discussed at each step of the way. One of the positive things when I went to the radiotherapy, death wasn't an option. <laughs> so, I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm progress somewhere along the line because now there was never a question yeah, yeah. of death. Of all the side effects, that wasn't going to be one of them. <laughs> that wasn't going to be one of them. When we went on that Tuesday meeting with all the specialists, we were told by uh, the main surgeon that he will, obviously his bias is towards surgery, and he thought that was the best thing to do. Um, we could have just had radiation and chemo, but I was willing to do whatever they told me because I'm so young, I, I, I want to live a long time. Um, I trusted that what they told me was the best thing to do, is what I want to do. I was willing to trust them. There were a lot of them talking together, working together to work out the best plan for me. And I want, I'm going with that plan. Um, the things that made it easier was acceptance on my behalf. I think if you accept what people have told you in, and don't have any other, like, uh, be denial or, or, or um, try to ignore what they've told you that the outcomes will be. I, I decided from the very onset to accept what they'd told me. And these guys were professionals in their field. I had to put myself in their hands for them to help me. I knew that they, they would make those decisions. I didn't need to worry about what they were going to do. They knew what they were going to do. So that helped me just accept what they'd told me. Um, accept that this was going to happen. The one thing that I decided or not worried about when, you know, the impact on my family was that I can't fall to pieces and sit in a corner and go down a big black hole with this because that makes it harder for them as well. I decided right from the beginning that I have to take a deep breath and accept it and get on with it because if I, if I lost the plot, how hard it would be for my children to see me lose the plot or lose that, you know? I had to be strong because they couldn't cope if I wasn't. Because I've always been the one they looked up to me and mum is strong and mum knows how to deal with everything. Mum knows what to do about everything. Mum's always looked after me. So I, I felt with my kids particularly, I had to, I had to take a deep breath and deal with it. I wasn't going to allow myself to feel that I couldn't cope with it because I had to because I still had them relying and looking at me every day when I had this done. It's important to talk to the people around you. Um, 
talking about things, you know, does does make it less of a, a burden to carry on your own. And it's important to try and learn to talk about things early on. But not all of us can do that. Um, and not all of us have someone around us. So if, if you don't have someone around you, it's important to find someone. And that's where your cancer care coordinator is a really vital person because she will give you that information and you can always check in with her and, and she'll be able to direct you to people that you need, you know, to get the information from. But really it's about sharing that burden rather than trying to carry it on your own. And that's for carers as well. So your family and friends will also try and be brave and strong and stoic and, and that's the way we're taught to cope, but it's not necessarily the best way in this situation. So it's important to talk about things, tap into your care coordinator for information and make sure that you're talking about what, what's going to happen next. In terms of the aloneness, it's really important that, that you try and address that. Um, and there's certainly services that exist within the hospital system to address that. So we have a psycho-oncology service. So people can come and talk to a psychologist or a clinical nurse consultant who have experience in working with, with patients with cancer. And we want to see people as early as we can in the sense that we don't want this to become something that overwhelms you. You know, the majority of people that I see in my position aren't crazy. They're not mad. You know, they're people that are struggling to deal with a life-changing situation and they're struggling with grief and they're struggling with relationship issues and intimacy issues. They're all normal responses to what is an abnormal situation. It's not normal to be diagnosed with a cancer. That's the thing that's wrong. The way you cope with it is to go through grief and I'm just here to support people do that. Your GP can refer you to psychologists in the community. There are plenty of options. So please think about taking them up. You've just had a diagnosis of head and neck cancer made. It's clearly a lot to deal with. It is clearly a significant journey that you're about to embark on, uh, should you choose. You certainly won't come out the same person that you were at the start of this process, but the simple fact is you will come out the other end as someone who will lead and continue to lead a rewarding life and overcome the ravages of this awful disease. But the amazing thing to me is to see the human spirit triumph and see uh, somebody who did not think they could deal with it go through the treatment, come out the other side and then follow them up and see them living fulfilling happy lives five, ten years into the future.